Canada has maintained good active systems of prudent and measured regulation. Now, I should just be clear, we do not claim that our system is perfect. The lack of a single national securities regulator is an obvious hole. The vast majority of our provinces are now working with us to fill that gap. We've also been obliged to tighten the criteria for government mortgage ins insurance. So there are things we can and will do. But overall, the performance of this sector during the crisis showcased the effectiveness of Canada's approach. Through our G20 chairmanship this year, we want to urge the adoption of similar regulatory practices globally. And in this regard, I believe the Canadian system generally does two things that should guide future work in this area. First, we must promote national regulation sufficiently strong to avoid repetition of the kind of crisis we experienced last year. We also believe that such national systems should be subject to international peer review in order to enhance transparency and reduce risks to the global economy. Anything less would expose every economy to needless risk. In fact, if inadequate regulation is not addressed, I believe the consequences could actually be worse than before the crisis. If after a period of renewed stability, institutions are able to return to the irresponsible practices that caused the crisis, what would they have learned? They would have learned a very bad lesson. That is, that reckless behavior can be engaged in because national governments will ultimately backstop the consequences. And that, ladies and gentlemen, would be a very dangerous precedent. <laughs> Obviously, then, financial sector regulation must be tackled and it must be adequate. But second, Canada also believes that financial sector regulation must have the right purposes and must not be excessive. Now let me just say, first of all, that I understand why there are calls for such approaches in some circles. In situations very different than Canada's, where big bank failures resulted in public bailouts, where the public endured the pain, yet those who caused it seemed to emerge unscathed, there is understandably public anger and demands for tough or even retaliatory action. In Canada, because our situation has been so different, we don't face such demands and public opinion is much more reflective about what is needed. Our approach to financial sector regulation in Canada, while historically much more activist than in many other countries, has not been to micromanage the affairs of a complex industry. Its purpose is to ensure transparency in the marketplace, help link risk, performance and reward, and encourage a culture of prudent behavior focused on the long term. Soyons clair. So, to be clear, through the G20, we will be encouraging strengthened financial sector regulation and improved coordination between regulators. But Canada will not go down the path of excessive, arbitrary or punitive regulation of its financial sector. Through the G20, we will be encouraging strengthened financial sector regulation and improve coordination between regulators. But Canada will not go down the path of excessive, arbitrary, or punitive regulation of its financial sector. Canada, Canada has a well-regulated free market economy with a private financial sector of enormous strength. We intend to build on that advantage. We intend to see the financial sector in Canada grow and we intend Canada's global position in that industry to get stronger yet in the future. The second ongoing G20 policy debate and policy priority has been to drive globally coordinated stimulus measures, both monetary and fiscal. We believe it is important to stay the course, but only for now. It remains my conviction that fiscal expansion 
enhance government spending, and increase fiscal deficits were necessary during the, re during the recession. In fact, with rapidly falling output and employment and interest rates near zero, economic theory has been very clear this was the only option. The temptation today to see hopeful signs of recovery everywhere in small things is understandable. So then would be the wish to declare recovery here and abandon last year's commitments to these expensive public investments. We believe that would be a mistake. The truth is that despite the G20's good work during the last 15 months, the recovery is a mile wide but only an inch deep and job creation remains very tentative. Too soon to abandon stimulus programs, it is no longer too early to start thinking about a strategy to exit such programs. But while it is absolutely too soon, too soon, excuse me, while it is absolutely too soon to abandon stimulus programs, it is no longer too early to start thinking about a strategy to exit them because we all know the long-term risks of prolonged government spending of this magnitude. Renewed inflation, rising interest rates, crowding out of investment, prolonged sluggish economic performance. This view informs our economic planning in Canada. Canada will complete its two-year economic action plan, its fiscal stimulus measures in support of the recovery, support of the economy. We shall faithfully meet all the promises we made at earlier G20 meetings. At the same time, our next budget will outline a path to reduce the deficit and return to balanced budgets in the medium term. We will, we will be doing this, I should add. We will be doing this, I want to talk about this Canadian advantage. We'll, we will be doing this from levels of deficit and debt that are by comparison with other advanced industrialized economies quite modest. We have the lowest level of indebtedness in the G7 by far, and when the recession ends, our relative levels of indebtedness will still be lower by an even wider margin. That is because Canada paid off debt aggressively during the growth years. Now, in passing, as an economist, I must observe that this particular recommendation of John Maynard Keynes is seldom acted upon as vigorously as his permission to borrow. I would say that in this regard, Keynesianism is a bit like communism. According to those who advocate it, neither has been properly attempted. <laughs> so thus, uh, governments borrow when times are difficult because they must, and then they borrow more when times are easy because they can. But instead, true Keynesians that we are accused of being, our government paid $38 billion off Canada's national debt between 2006 and 2009. And that's in incidentally, is what allowed us to lower taxes in Canada. We believe it is important that taxes be low and that tax reductions be sustainable. That way they become a permanent form of fiscal stimulus. In an environment of falling debt, we were able to lower taxes of all kinds. In fact, Canada has already the lowest tax rate on new business investment in the G7. Investors take note, Canada is and will remain open for business. Now finally, let us talk about global trade and growth strategies. I suspect every single person in this room, I suspect every single person in this room, understands that the growth in global trade has been largely responsible for wealth creation worldwide in the past generation. And therefore, enhancing trade and resisting protectionism is both essential to the world economy and to the just cause of raising millions of people from poverty. The G20 has said this at every single meeting. Of course, there have been national actions, maybe too many, that detract from that goal. Even so, we have thus far avoided anything like the protectionism that turned the stock market crash of 1929 into a decade-long depression. In Canada, we have tried, continue to try to be leaders in promoting free trade and open markets. Our stimulus package, I should mention, did not raise tariffs. It lowered them, unilaterally, I might add. Since 2006, we have concluded...